Hello everybody, I appreciate you all being flexible with changing the format of our class. Um, please feel free to send me questions as you watch. Um, this class will be a bit drier and less exciting than the other classes, but understanding your soil well is really the difference between a successful garden and an unsuccessful one. So what we're going to talk about today is what soil actually is and why it behaves the way it does. We'll talk about uh, differences in soil and soil types, uh, then organic matter and compost, what they are, why they're important. We'll go over soil testing and what your results will look like, and then the nutrients your plants need and how to add them. So your soil samples are not back from the lab yet, so I will just be speaking sort of generally today. Springtime is very busy in soil labs, but hopefully we will have our results back within about a week or so, and then we can get into specifics when I send you your results. So I'm going to throw a lot of information at you, so just absorb what feels helpful to you and don't worry about getting every little detail. Uh, this is for your benefit. There are no tests, so don't stress about it. Um, I'm also going to explain things in maybe more detail than you really need, but uh, for myself at least, I tend to learn and remember things much better if I understand why things are the way they are. So I'm not just going to give you a list of what to do because that won't really help you um, and not nearly as much as if you were to learn the reasons for everything. I know all of us are familiar with soil, but it's not often that we think about what soil is actually made out of. Soil is just made of soil, right? Well, essentially soil is made up of a balance of air, water, rocks, and organic matter. Half of the bulk of your soil is actually all just air and water. The balance of air and water together is around 50% of your soil, but how much air and how much water will vary depending on the day. If it recently rained, it could be 40% water and 10% air, or if it's been dry, then vice versa. Your organic matter is often around 5% of your soil, but it could be as low as 1% or as high as 10%. Organic matter is anything that is or ever was alive, like compost, microorganisms like bacteria and fungi, decomposing plant and bug parts, all that sort of thing. Some people call this humus. And then the rest of the soil is made up of tiny crushed rocks. You may be familiar with the three soil types, sand, silt, and clay. There's also gravel, which are the little pebbles in your soil, which are good to have around. Sand, silt, and clay are all tiny rocks. And the main difference between them is just their size. Combinations of sand, silt, and clay are called loam. And there are different types of loams. Like if you have a sandy loam, that just means it's mostly sand, but also has some silt or clay. So sand is just like beach sand. It's often a little smaller in soil, but the same concept. If you look closely at a handful of beach sand, you can see each tiny rock. They may seem small, but these are actually the largest type of particle. If you rub sand between your fingers, you can feel the grittiness. There's a very wide var variation in the size of sand from coarse to fine, but it's by far the largest type. If you were to take silt, the next smallest particle, and rub it between your fingers, it would feel very smooth, more like flour or cornstarch. This is because silt particles are much, much smaller than sand. And then finally, you have clay, which is like you took that handful of sand and crushed and powdered it down all the way until it was microscopic. You can see on this diagram that the tiny clay dot is five times larger than it should be. And this is the exact same clay that pottery is made out of, but that clay just doesn't have other materials in it like clay soil does. Clay soil is very thick and sticky and moldable, and many of us in this area have clay soil. If a grain of sand were the size of a barrel, a grain of silt would be closer to the size of a baseball, and a grain of clay would be like the size of a coin. It's a pretty big difference. And there are pros and cons to having each of these three particles in your soil, and I will talk about that in a minute. So this triangle is what is used to figure out exactly what soil type a soil is from its percentages of sand, silt, and clay. 
Basically, you have your clay corner, your silt corner, and your sand corner. And if your soil is closer to being a mix of all three, it's a loam. So if you have sand and clay but no silt, you have a sandy clay soil, or mostly silt, and a little bit of the other two, you have a silty loam, and so on. Your soil type is based on the geology of your yard, what it was like millions of years ago. Clay is often found in the mountains, silt in floodplains and deltas, and sand in coastal and desert areas. But this can vary a lot based on your exact location. I once worked on a farm on the coast of California that had two fields about a mile apart on a hillside near the ocean. The lower field had very sandy soil because many thousands of years ago it had been underwater, and the higher field had a clay soil because it had always been a hilltop. Here's a photo of all of your soil samples, and you can see that they are all pretty different even though they were all taken within a few miles of each other. And as a side note, color can tell you quite a bit about your soil, but a soil test can tell you all the same things a bit more accurately. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about sand and clay in this lecture because they are the two extremes and silt usually behaves in between the two. Um, but a couple of unique things about silty soils is that they tend to be the dustiest and they form crusts on the surface more often than the other two. This can cause water pooling, but it can also help keep weeds down as its own sort of mulch. So, in sand, you have really large grains, which means that there are larger spaces between them. So sandy soils tend to be looser and have more air in them. This means that water drains out of it really well, but that also means the water will flush away nutrients and organic matter with it, and you'll also need to water more often. On the opposite end, clay holds together really tightly because the particles are so small. Think about holding a handful of sand versus a handful of clay. Sand is light and loose and falls through your fingers, but the clay holds together in a dense ball. This leaves less room for water and air, and it will drain much slower. But it hangs onto nutrients much better, and you will have water in the times when you need it. Clay is really not a bad thing. It can be a blessing. You just have to take very good care of it. There are two main characteristics of soil, its texture and its structure. When people talk about your soil type, they're generally referring to your soil texture, your percentage of sand, silt, and clay. Since it comes from the geological history of your garden location, it's not something that's going to change unless you go to extreme measures. And even if you do go dump a bunch of sand into your clay soil or vice versa, it could backfire and actually make your soil texture much worse than it was before. It's possible to do it on a very small scale, but if you can, it's much better to just learn how to make the most of your soil type. What you can change, however, is your soil texture. Healthy soil will clump together into aggregates around the size and shape of large crumbs. This helps sandy soil hold together more and clay soil stick to itself less, so it's helpful no matter what soil type you have. You can form aggregates by adding organic matter. This will take time, a period of years, it's like planting a forest, but it will improve your soil structure dramatically. Pore spaces in between your soil particles are as important as the particles themselves. These open spaces give room for air and water to be stored in your soil and for nutrients and organisms to move through it. You need air for all of the organisms in the soil to live, including the plant roots. Water is obviously also necessary for plants and it facilitates the movement of nutrients in the soil. There are two different types of pores in soil, micro and macro. Micropores on the left are in between each individual particle of sand or clay. This is mostly determined by your particle size. Larger particles like sand have more space in between them and clay has less. Like I mentioned with sand, however, it is possible to have too much pore space where everything drains right through. That's why loam is generally considered to be the best type of soil because it has a mix of particle sizes to give just the right amount of pore space. Macropores Larger scale pores, like on the right, are determined more by the organic matter in your soil. Overall, both micro and macro pores serve much of the same purpose. Micro pores give space for air and water, macro pores give space for microorganisms and roots. 
Because if you really think about it, plant roots don't actually grow in soil. They grow through all of the spaces around all of the particles. And roots aren't all that strong, and they don't like a challenge, which is why pore space is so important for them and why it's so important to prevent compaction. Soil compaction is when your soil gets squished down by forces like heavy rain or your boot or tools like tillers when the soil is too wet and the pore spaces get crushed. Vegetable roots have some strength, but if it's too hard for them to work their way through the soil, they're either going to turn and go elsewhere, like sideways or even back upward, or just give up completely and they're really going to struggle. If it's difficult to push your finger through the soil, it'll be hard for your roots to push through it too. If you take anything away from any of these classes, this is it. Compacting your soil will take you back years in your work towards improving your soil structure. It is the quickest way to stress out your crops and make things much harder on yourself. Do not step or kneel too close to your plants at any time, but especially when the soil is wet. Always stay on your paths. You won't always see a mark from compaction, but if you do, it's very bad news. And no matter what soil type you have, but especially if you have clay soil, do not ever work your soil when it's too wet. This is mostly for heavy work like tilling, but it's also true for lighter work like hoeing. Not only is it less effective, it will destroy your soil and turn it into cement. You know how people talk about how hard their soil is in the summer, how it's rock solid? There's a pretty good chance that soil was compressed and there wasn't enough room anymore for air or water or roots or microorganisms. So how do you know if your soil is too wet to work? This will depend some on your soil type, but generally you can dig down about six inches and pick up a handful of soil. Squeeze it in your fist, not too hard, but firmly, and tap the ball and bounce it gently in your hand. If it breaks apart pretty easily, you're probably okay. But if it tries to hold together and you really have to tap hard or bounce it high to get it to break, it's too wet. And if it doesn't ball together at all, it's probably too dry to work, which can actually have the same destructive effects. This takes some practice, so try doing this often to get a feel for how your soil acts in different weather. And over time, you'll get used to your particular soil and about how many days it takes to drain. If you ever aren't sure, just play it safe and wait a little longer. It will mean a world of difference for your garden. So how do you know what your soil type is? There are a few methods you can use at home, the ribbon test and the jar test. And then your cation exchange capacity is a measurement listed on your soil test report that's also a good indicator of soil type. And I encourage you to try all three of these methods and compare results between them. So the ribbon test is the quickest way to get an idea of your soil type. Basically, you just wet a little bit of your soil in your hand and then see how far you can push it out of your hand in a ribbon. This flowchart and other similar ones walk you through a few questions and depending on how your soil behaves and how long your ribbon gets, it will tell you what type of soil you probably have. It can be a little bit tricky to get right, but it takes minimal effort. It's also a good way to get used to the feel of your soil so that you can notice any changes. And there's a link to this flowchart at the end so you can actually read it. The jar test is a little bit more involved, but it's still pretty easy and it's pretty interesting too. Uh, you take a sample of your soil the same way you would for your soil test. Uh, sift it first if you have a lot of pebbles, roots, things like that. And then add it to a clear glass jar with some water. Uh, quart mason jars work really well. Um, roughly one third soil and two thirds water with a little space at the top. And you shake the jar for several minutes to break up any soil clumps and then let it sit for a couple days. The soil should gradually settle into layers with organic matter floating on top of the water and then clay, then silt, and then sand at the bottom. If your water is still cloudy, there's a good chance that your soil has a bit more clay, but it shouldn't be too far off. So you measure the height of all three soil layers and then the height of each individual layer. And then you calculate the percentage of each layer from the total soil height. And then you go to the soil triangle and mark each of your three percentages. 
Numbers along the side are angled in the same direction as the line to follow, and the place where all three lines intersect tells you your soil type. You may land on the border of multiple types, and if you do, you can sort of choose based on your observations or by trying a different test like the ribbon test. Your cation exchange capacity, or CEC, is one of the numbers that will come back with your soil test, and your number can tell you roughly what type of soil you may have, with the lowest numbers being sand and the highest being clay. Humus is organic matter and it has the highest CEC of all. Okay, great. What does that actually mean? Your CEC is the measure of the nutrient holding ability of your soil. We don't need to dig too deep into the chemistry here, but basically it's how well your sand and clay particles can hold and exchange your soil minerals like calcium and magnesium. You can see here a clay particle with a bunch of nutrients stuck all over it and it's exchanging them with the plant's roots. Clay particles are far, far better at holding and exchanging nutrients than sandy soils. So having a higher CEC, like in clay soil, means that your soil can hold more nutrients. If your CEC is low, like in sandy soils, you will need to fertilize your soil more often because the nutrients don't stick around in your soil for very long, but you will also need to fertilize less so that the nutrients don't just all wash away. Since your CEC is based on your soil type, this number isn't really something that you can change too much without significant effort. So overall, it's more of something to keep in mind than something to try to change, but the one thing that you can do is add organic matter. As you can see, organic matter, or humus, has a much higher CEC than clay or sand, so adding organic matter will boost your CEC. Your soil organic matter, shortened to SOM or sometimes just OM, is the percentage of your soil that is made up of organic matter. SOM should be at least 2%, but if you can get it to 5% or higher, you're doing great. So, like I mentioned, organic matter is everything in your soil that is or ever was alive, including plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, and part of it is dead and decomposing, and this is where a lot of your soil nutrients come from. And the other part is alive and helping to decompose all of the dead stuff, so that the nutrients are available to your plants. So soil is its own entire ecosystem. It's like a mini world with predators and prey, scavengers, symbiotic relationships where different organisms work together, and parasitic relationships where they exploit one another. It's a lot. And don't worry about them being germs, they're not dangerous, and exposure to soil bacteria has actually been proven to have a mood boosting effect. So the microorganisms, the tiny creatures in your soil, come in all different types, from single cells like bacteria all the way up to worms and centipedes. All of them are helpful to your soil in their own way. For example, worms eat dead materials and turn them into nutrient-rich worm castings, and they tunnel through the soil and loosen it up. There's a type of fungus called mycorrhiza that attaches onto plant roots and essentially turns itself into more roots, hugely multiplying the amount of nutrients that the plants are able to take up. And a bit later on, I'll give an example of a way that bacteria can convert nitrogen into a form that crops can use. People like to use worms as an indicator of healthy soil because they're easy to see. And it is a good method, but don't forget that there are a whole lot more little creatures in your soil, all doing their part, and you need to make sure that you're keeping them healthy so that they can do their work. Don't think about feeding your plants when you add amendments. Think about feeding your soil. And I mean that literally because there are upwards of a billion bacteria in a single teaspoon of soil. And these bacteria and other microorganisms are absolutely vital to your soil health because they break down the nutrients into a form that your plants are able to digest. So you aren't the ones feeding your plants, they are. And they need organic matter to eat. So take very good care of your soil microbes and they will do most of the work for you can't have healthy plants and healthy vegetables without healthy soil. There are a million reasons to add organic matter to your soil, but here are some of the most significant. Having a high percentage of organic matter in your soil improves the nutrition of your soil by storing nutrients in the form of decomposing material, housing microorganisms to break the nutrients down into bioavailable forms, forms that your plants are able to digest, and by creating symbiotic relationships like the mycorrhizae fungus extending your plant's roots.
It can also improve your soil structure by encouraging soil particles to form aggregates, which create macropores for water, roots, air, and microorganisms to travel through. This means that sandy soils become better able to hold on to water and nutrients, and that clay soils become easier to work and drain better. So no matter what to soil type you have, adding organic matter can always improve it. Compost is the easiest way to increase organic matter and overall the best thing you can add to your soil. It replaces a broad spectrum of nutrients, including micronutrients, and is almost entirely organic matter to boost all of the things that I just mentioned. Think of it this way. By harvesting your crops, you're removing nutrients from your soil. Even pulling weeds is removing nutrients. So if you add plant matter back in, then you can replace those nutrients for your next crop. And composting them first gives the microorganisms a chance to break it all down into the most easily digestible form for your plants. Compost is decomposed plant and animal material, including crop residue, the parts of the plant that you didn't eat, weeds, food scraps, fallen leaves, livestock manure, straw, lawn clippings, and any other organic matter that you can safely use. And I wouldn't recommend adding any uncomposted organic matter to your soil, especially if you're including any animal products like manure. Always compost everything thoroughly first. We will go a lot more into depth on compost in May, but basically this should always be your go-to soil amendment. It supplies most of the nutrients that your soil will need and if you add it a couple weeks before planting, it will give your plants enough of a nitrogen boost that you may not need to add any more. I've said it before, I'll say it many times again, but adding organic matter, particularly in the form of compost, is the best thing that you can do for your soil. And what's the worst thing? Compaction. So, how do you actually know what's in your soil? There are many methods, but the easiest and the most accurate is to send your soil sample into a lab. For your gardens, we're using Virginia Tech, and they charge $10 for the basic test, or $16 if you add the optional test for soluble salts and organic matter. Anyone is allowed to submit samples to their lab, and all you have to do is fill out the form and mail them your sample. So for those of you who couldn't be there for your soil samples, I want to run through the process really quickly. All you need is a clean bucket or container, a digging tool, the flatter the better to get an accurate sample, and your sample box and form from the lab. And the Virginia Tech materials are available at the county admin office in Marion up on Hospital Hill. So what you do is you just dig holes into your garden soil at random to get a representative sample, basically trying to take the average of all of your soil. You don't wanna choose any place that is different from the rest, like a path or maybe a place that you amended specially last year because you don't want it to end up out of proportion in your tiny box. So you start digging your hole by removing anything on the surface of your soil because you don't want anything other than dirt to end up in the box. Then you dig down to the depth that you work your soil. So since this year we will be using a tiller that goes about seven inches deep, we dug seven inch deep holes because all of those top seven inches of your garden will get stirred together. And if you choose not to till or turn your soil after that, then you can dig down around five or six inches. Then the easiest thing to do is open up the hole, remove some dirt so that you can see what you're doing. And then you take a slice down the side of the hole, roughly an inch thick, trying to get an even thickness on your slice all the way down so that your top inch has as much representation in your sample as the bottom inch. Then you dump it into your bucket Repeat all around your garden at least five or six times for a small garden, but 10 is better for better accuracy. Once your bucket is at least a third or better halfway full of soil, stir your soil in the bucket really well. You want to break up any aggregates and remove any rocks or big roots or bugs. Once your soil is really well mixed, take enough out to fill the sample box up to the line. And once you've done that, you can fill in your holes and dump the rest of your bucket back in the garden. And then you just fill out the form and mail off your sample. The only stressful thing about a soil test is that the lab is using a tiny amount of your soil to make assumptions about your entire garden's worth of soil. So if you have even a small amount of something that shouldn't be there, or you have your depth proportions off too much, that could throw off your test. So just make sure that your tools are very clean and that you sample carefully.
In the lab form and website give detailed instructions on how to sample your soil, but here are a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, don't sample when soil is wet. It's a bad idea anyway, uh, but it can also mess with your results. Uh, after you take your sample, let your soil dry out even more before you mail it, and uh, this also makes postage cheaper. Uh, sampling in the fall will give you plenty of time to add amendments and let them settle in before the spring, and it also usually gives a quicker turnaround at the lab. Um, you also want to be consistent with sampling from year to year. You want to use the same time of year, the same tools, the same lab, and so on to keep it um, as consistent as possible. Don't sample if you've recently added any amendments or fertilizer. Wait a couple months for everything to settle out. You may want to sample every year while you get started, but later on as your levels stabilize and you aren't adding amendments as often, you can switch to as little as every four years or so if you prefer. So this is what a Virginia Tech soil test looks like. It's pretty simple. Some labs will do fancy colors and graphs, but this gets the job done. Uh, basically, it has your data on the top half and any recommendations on the bottom half. And then the back has more detailed explanations of what all of the tests mean. So your major nutrients are ranked as low, medium, high, or very high. So L, M, H, or VH with plus or minus to be more specific and your micronutrients are just labeled as sufficient or deficient. For the soluble salts, you want that to be low because soluble salts are toxic. Soil pH, we'll talk about that in a moment. Don't worry about the buffer index, that's just used for calculations. Then you have your CEC, which you already know about, and then all of those percentages are just more detailed measurements of your CEC, they're not important. And then finally you have your percentage of organic matter. One thing you usually won't see on a soil test is nitrogen. Nitrogen can't be accurately measured in a soil test because it changes all the time, depending on temperature, moisture, aeration, and so on. Um, the lab recommendations for nitrogen are based on the crop code on the test form. So in our case, that's vegetable garden. So we'll get general nitrogen recommendations for a vegetable garden. These are the recommendations from the lab on how to amend your soil. The most common recommendations are for lime to adjust your soil pH and for basic fertilizer. They will also add notes if you had any out of the ordinary results like for soluble salts. For a vegetable garden, recommendations will be given as pounds per 100 square feet. So you will have to do a little bit of math to figure out exactly how much you'll need. The homegrown example garden is 320 square feet. So if you have that size, you could just triple the recommendation for 100 square feet. Uh, and with these recommendations, it's definitely better to underestimate rather than overestimate. And also keep in mind that Virginia Tech gives non-organic recommendations, and we'll talk about that a little later on, but it's good to take their recommendations with a grain of salt and think about whether they're most uh, the most environmentally friendly option. You also might want to use a tiny bit less than they recommend because they might be trying to help you maximize your yield rather than optimize it, growing as much as possible instead of as healthy as possible. But overall, you can trust them and they give good recommendations. So breaking down your test results, let's start with pH because this is a very common soil adjustment to make. So pH is the measure of how acidic a material is from 1 to 14. 1 is very acidic, 7 is neutral, and alkaline is, uh, sorry, 14 is alkaline or basic. Water is neutral at 7. And all kinds of materials have different pHs, as you can see up above the scale. Your soil's pH is based on the pHs of all of the different materials in your soil. Virtually all crops prefer a slightly acid soil between 6 and 7, with 6.5 usually considered ideal. Each crop has certain preferences, and a few prefer even more acidic soils, but it's very rare that you would see a crop that would grow best above 7. Your pH affects the bioavailability of most of the nutrients in your soil, how accessible they are to the plants. Each nutrient has a different bioavailability based on a bunch of chemistry we don't need to go into, but six to seven is the range where the most nutrients are available to your plants. You can see on this chart that the widest part is where each nutrient is most available. So if your pH is too far outside of that six to seven range, you could have the perfect balance of nutrients in your soil, 
but you would still end up with imbalances in your plants because they wouldn't be able to absorb them. So this is why we generally start with soil pH before we mess with any other amendments. So over time, water in your soil gradually makes it more acidic. This is especially important in places where it rains a lot, like here. Rainy locations tend to have much more acid soils than dry regions. So this means that you'll have to periodically bring your soil pH up to keep it from getting too acidic for your plants. And this is where liming comes in. Nothing to do with the fruit. Agricultural lime is powdered limestone, calcium carbonate. It's a white powder that you can mix into your soil to raise the pH to make it less acid. Your soil test will tell you the pH of your soil and then give you recommendations on how much lime to add to your garden, if any. And you should only need to lime your soil every two to three years or less. So if all you need to do is raise your soil pH, use calcitic lime. This is generally thought of as regular lime, it's just calcium carbonate. If you want to lime your soil but you also need magnesium, you can use dolomitic lime, which contains both calcium and magnesium. Sandy soil is more likely to need magnesium than clay soil. And you don't want to use dolomitic lime if you already have plenty of magnesium. And just as a side note, there are other types of lime out there. Burnt lime, quick lime, slaked lime, and hydrated or dehydrated lime are not the same as agricultural lime and should not be used in your garden. You're not likely to come across these, but if you do, don't get them confused. Also, some people use wood ashes instead of lime. And this is fine to do, but you have to be more careful about it. It contains a number of other nutrients, which can be good, but only if your soil test justifies it. You will also need to use the correct amount, which is different than the amount of lime that you would use, and you need to check your pH more often. If you need to lower your pH and make the soil more acid, you would add sulfur instead of lime. And never add more lime or sulfur than is recommended because Having too much in your soil can block nutrient availability. It also takes several months for your pH to fully change, so you should add lime in the fall if you can so that it's ready for spring, but we will still be fine this year. So, all plants need carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but these come from the air and water so they can take care of themselves. And then there are a bunch more nutrients that plants need to take up from the soil. Your primary nutrients are the ones that your plants need in the highest quantities. These nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And their elemental symbols are what you see on most commercial fertilizers, N, P, and K. Your secondary nutrients are the ones used in the next highest amounts, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. And then there are a whole number of other micronutrients, also called trace minerals, that your plants need to survive copper, iron, manganese, zinc, boron, molybdenum, cobalt, chlorine, and nickel. Just because they are needed in smaller amounts, that doesn't mean that they are any less important. Plant nutrients work in much of the same way that they do for humans. So plant macronutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Human macronutrients are proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. We eat those in the largest amounts, so they're very important, but that doesn't mean that we don't also need vitamins and minerals. So we'll start with the primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Since these are needed in the greatest quantities, these are the most likely nutrients you may need to add in amendments. Each plays a main role in plant growth. Nitrogen is mainly responsible for the greenery on your plant, the stems and the leaves. Phosphorus handles the other plant parts, roots, flowers, fruits, and seeds. Potassium takes care of plant health, like photosynthesis, respiration, and immune function. When you see a bag or bottle of fertilizer at the store, it will have three numbers on it that tell you the relative amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, N, P, and K in that order. These numbers are a percentage of the nutrients in the fertilizer. So this bag of Harmony fertilizer has a ratio of 5, 4, 3, which means it contains 5% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, and 3% potassium. So since it's a 50 pound bag, that means two and a half pounds of nitrogen and so on. This bag shows two different kinds of nitrogen, 1% water soluble and 4% water insoluble, which means that 1% is quickly available and 4% will be released more slowly. You can also see that this bag contains 9% calcium, 
Some fertilizers do contain other nutrients than N, P, and K, and others don't, but they won't be a part of the ratio. They'll just be listed elsewhere on the package, so that's important to check for. So obviously these percentages don't equal 100, so what else is in there? Uh, many fertilizers will contain filler ingredients that don't add value, but just add bulk to make them safer and easier to use. This harmony is made from composted poultry manure, so some of it is inert organic matter, and some of it will also become available as nutrients over time. You will probably see fertilizers at the store that have the same ratios but different numbers, like a 555 fertilizer and a 101010 fertilizer. The 101010 isn't better for your plants, it's just a stronger concentration, so you'll need to use less. Uh, I'd recommend using fertilizers with lower numbers because it's harder to overdo it, but overall the ratio is more important than the numbers themselves. A fertilizer made for lawns would be very different from a fertilizer made for flowers because for lawns you want a lot of greenery, so you want high nitrogen, but for flowers you would want higher phosphorus so your plant can focus on its flowers. In a small vegetable garden, it's not very practical to fertilize every crop differently, so you would want to choose something that will work for your whole garden. But that doesn't mean that you should choose something with a perfectly balanced ratio either. You need to consult with your soil test to see whether your soil already has plenty of phosphorus or potassium or if it needs more of either of them. So nitrogen fertilizers are the most widely available because they are everyone's favorite nutrient to apply to their plants. It makes them grow very big, very fast. And there are fertilizers that contain only nitrogen and very little of anything else, and others that contain mostly nitrogen but also contain other nutrients. Mixed sources are generally preferable, particularly in the form of compost and cover crop residue, but there are also sources of pure nitrogen if that's what you feel your plants need. Uh, other mixed sources include composted poultry manure and alfalfa meal, which also contain phosphorus and potassium and assorted trace minerals, and just about every commercial fertilizer will focus on uh, nitrogen. Many organic fertilizers come in the form of animal byproducts, such as blood meal, bone meal, feather meal. Uh, these are just powders, just like other fertilizers. They're not nearly as scary as they sound. This is blood meal. Uh, but they all have non-animal alternatives if you would prefer not to use them. As long as you are adding compost before you plant and you're seeing good yields, you may not need to add nitrogen fertilizer. Also in this class, I'm only listing a few common fertilizer types, but there are many, many more. Okay, so this looks a little freaky, but if you see this on your roots, it's good news. It means that your legume crop has added valuable nitrogen to your soil. Your legumes are beans, peas, alfalfa, and clover. So there's a whole lot of nitrogen floating around in the air, but unfortunately it's not in a form that plants are able to use. Multiple nitrogen molecules need to be fixed together, attached to each other, to be available to plants. There are multiple types of bacteria in the soil that fix nitrogen, but certain bacteria, called rhizobia, produce a lot by joining forces with legume crops. These bacteria live on legume roots in these little root nodules, these round bumps, and they pull in nitrogen from the soil air, which is another good reason to keep your soil well aerated, and convert it into a form that the plants are able to take up. If you dig up a healthy bean or pea plant, you will hopefully see these nodules all over the roots. And if you were to cut one of them open, it should be pink inside from all of the bacterial activity. To make sure that your soil will have enough rhizobia for your plants, you can buy a packet of the bacteria in a powder and mix it with your legume seeds before you plant them. This is called inoculation. So basically, the bacteria are doing all of the work of nitrogen fixation, but your legume plants get to benefit from all of this nitrogen as free fertilizer. They will use most of it up, but some of it will be left over in the soil and in your crop residue. This process is especially helpful if you grow cover crops with legumes. A cover crop is a crop whose only job is feeding the soil. You don't harvest any of it. When you incorporate it back in, you will get a big boost of nitrogen. One note on nitrogen, uh, plants have a form of an immune system, just like we do, that's powered by vitamins, uh, micronutrients, just like ours is. 
and if they are not properly nourished, their immune system suffers, which results in more pest and disease issues. Nutrient deficiencies can cause plant weakness, but the biggest culprit is actually an excess of nitrogen. Aphids in particular are a big sign of a weak plant, and more often than not, that's an over-fertilized plant. Nitrogen for plants is a lot like sugar for humans. It is a nutrient, it gives us energy, and we love it, but if we overdo it, it can cause us serious health issues. For us, that might look like diabetes, obesity, heart disease. For a plant, it would look like excessive greenery at the expense of roots and fruits, a weaker defense against pests and disease, and watery tasting produce. This is one of the reasons why grocery store produce usually has a very weak flavor compared to garden produce. Commercial growers pump their plants full of nitrogen so they will take up water and weigh more, but this just swells them up and dilutes their nutrient content. And nutrients taste good. This is where the flavors of your vegetables come from. Humans are designed to love sugar because our ancestors didn't have very much access to it. And plants are the same way because nitrogen fertilizers are rare out in nature. So if you give a plant too much nitrogen, it will eat itself sick like a kid in a candy store and ignore every other nutrient in the soil. So don't over fertilize. If you are adding plenty of compost and using cover crops, you may not need to add nitrogen at all. All right, so phosphorus, this can be a bit tricky because there are several ways that it can appear like you have a phosphorus deficiency even if you don't. Your soil might have plenty of phosphorus in it, but your plants could be phosphorus deficient if your pH is imbalanced or if there is an excess of other nutrients like nitrogen where it outcompetes. Uh, aluminum and calcium can also block phosphorus from being taken up. So if your soil pH is about uh, 7 or higher, you may have enough phosphorus in your soil, but your plants are not able to absorb it. So try bringing your pH down between 6.5 and 6.8 before adding phosphorus because that should make it more bioavailable if it is there in your soil. So mixed sources of phosphorus include compost, uh, bone meal, which also has a dose of calcium, fish bone meal, which is very similar but can have a little bit more nitrogen in there too, and then for phosphorus only, uh, you can use rock phosphate. And uh, you want to be careful because an over-application of phosphorus can block iron and zinc, uh, kill mycorrhiza, which is that uh, helpful fungi, and then uh, also cause pollution. So make sure that you add it wisely. So potassium, you will frequently see potassium listed on fertilizers as potash, but it's the same thing. Uh, if you add organic matter on a regular basis, you will probably have enough potassium, but rock dusts like azomite are generally not a bad idea. Mixed sources of potassium often come uh, with sulfur and magnesium too, like sulfate of potash, sulpo mag, which is literally sulfur, potassium, and magnesium, green sand, and wood ashes, which uh, does raise pH. If you want to focus on potassium, you can use seaweed in a powder or a liquid, or a rock dust like azomite, uh, which is a brand name, and it contains a lot of trace minerals. Too much potassium can block magnesium and calcium and cause uh, plant deficiencies in those nutrients. So your secondary nutrients. Starting with calcium, uh, soils aren't too likely to be deficient in calcium unless they are particularly acid or if your soil has received too much water. Uh, liming your soil will generally add plenty of calcium because it is calcium carbonate. Uh, if you do not need to change your pH, but you do need to add calcium, you can add gypsum, and this also contains sulfur. And uh, an excess of calcium can block magnesium and potassium. So magnesium is somewhat prone to deficiency because it is easily leached or drained from the soil especially in soils with a low CEC. Uh, and magnesium must be balanced with calcium and potassium to avoid any blocking. You want to make sure that you're adding the right amendment um, all the time, but with magnesium too, because adding you know, more uh, magnesium to your soil won't help if you think your problem is a lack of magnesium, but it's actually too much calcium. And magnesium is found in dolomitic limestone if you want to 
raise pH uh, and sulpomag if you want to keep pH. Sulfur uh, deficiency usually only occurs if you aren't adding organic matter. Uh, crop residues, animal manures, compost, all sources, sources of sulfur, and uh, those are also all sources of most of these other nutrients. Um, you can use granular sulfur, uh, which lowers your pH, or sulpomag, which has a steady pH and also includes potassium and magnesium, or gypsum if you want to keep your pH and just add calcium. So micronutrients, like I said, these nutrients are no less important, but since they are needed in smaller quantities, it's less likely that you will need to add specific amendments for them. Do not add specific micronutrient amendments unless you're instructed by your soil test as an excess of many of them can cause toxicity in the soil. But if you do have an imbalance, these are the most likely. Iron can have a lack of bioavailability even if it's present in the soil. Uh, this can happen if you have a high pH, uh, poor aeration in your soil, or if you have too much lime or too much manganese. Uh, manganese can also be blocked by high pH or poor soil structure. Molybdenum uh, deficiency is a bit tricky because it mirrors uh, nitrogen deficiency, so watch out for that. And uh, zinc also can be caused by poor soil structure or also too much uh, phosphorus. So that's a lot of different products. How in the world are you supposed to choose? For most of them, you probably won't need to. Generally, just add compost and follow your soil tests. But there are a few clues that can help signal that you might need to check your nutrient levels. Every nutrient has different deficiency symptoms, but the most telltale signs are usually discoloration of the leaves turning yellow, purple, too dark or too pale, or if you see slow stunted growth without a clear cause like pests or disease. Uh, we will talk more about this during the troubleshooting class. Um, if you are suspicious, of course you can get a soil test, but you can also reach out to the Smith County Extension Office. They are great at identifying these kinds of issues if you bring them photos or even bring in your dying plant. Uh, depending on which nutrient you have an issue with, it may be something that you can fix right away or you might have to work towards an improvement over time. And for the photo, if you're wondering, from right to left, it's healthy, phosphorus deficiency, potassium, nitrogen, and then magnesium deficiency. So if you are going to fertilize, which one should you choose? Uh, there are a few things to consider. First, I would like to mention that there are two meanings of the word organic. In agriculture, there is organic farming, organic certification, organic produce. This is all a legal definition that ensures the products were grown without using most synthetic chemicals or GMOs. I call this big O, organic. In other contexts, organic can also mean made up of living or once living things, like when we say organic matter. I call this little o, organic. And this can get a bit confusing because the phrase organic fertilizer could mean one of two things. It could mean that it's made from living things, or it could mean that it's approved for organic farming. For example, compost is little o organic because it's made from living things, and lime is mineral because it's made from rock. Both of them are approved for big o organic farming. Synthetic fertilizers are made in labs and are almost never allowed in organic farming. And there's really no reason to use synthetic fertilizers. For your own safety, for the safety of your kids and your pets, and for the environment, only use fertilizers that are approved for big O organic farming. You should see this OMRI label on the package. This means that it's certified. And the easiest way to figure out uh, which to buy is to only buy fertilizers from an organic supply company like Wolf Farm Natural Elements in Abingdon. And there are no complicated decisions, and they're also great with offering recommendations much better than uh, Walmart, someplace like that. So whether you choose mineral or little o organic fertilizers just means uh, it just depends on your plant's needs. So little o organic fertilizers contain nitrogen, while mineral fertilizers tend to contain uh, more micronutrients. So choose a granulated fertilizer for most applications. Uh, use liquid if you need to apply a foliar spray onto your leaves. Uh, for plant emergencies during the season. If you do this, you can use 
seaweed, fish emulsion, or compost tea, all of which we will talk more about later this year. Um, and fish emulsion and PK ratios can vary widely depending on the brand, so choose the best one for you. Uh, slow release fertilizer is generally much more effective than quick release. It helps your plants for a much longer time and much less goes to waste. A lot of people like synthetic fertilizers because they give instant results, but it's really not in your best interest. Your plants won't be able to absorb all of the nutrients, so some will go to waste and it can cause imbalances in your soil as well as pollution. And then choose an NPK ratio that matches your soil needs based on your test results. There's no one size fits all plan for amendments. It's a case by case basis because there are so many different factors and combinations that will be unique to your particular soil. Uh, but of course, I will help you choose whatever fertilizers you may need this year. So how do you amend? There are two different times to add amendments, before you plant your crops and during the growing season. So add lime or sulfur for your spring crops in the previous fall if you can, because pH takes a few months to completely change. Um, and at the beginning of the season, sprinkle any recommended amend amendments from your soil test and a healthy dose of compost onto your soil immediately before tilling or turning your soil. Then wait around two weeks before planting if possible to allow time for the soil to adjust to these amendments. Also make sure that compost is mixed into the soil well because if you leave it on the surface, uh, much of the nitrogen will be lost. And wait to add any nitrogen specific fertilizers you may be adding until your plants are established so that it doesn't wash away and go to waste. So I add compost twice a year, uh, especially if you plant both a spring and a fall crop. Um, a cover crop can take the place of one round of composting, just try to add fertility twice a year before spring planting and before fall planting. And in the years between soil tests, if you were given any long-term instructions, continue with those or otherwise just continue to add compost. So for in-season fertility, you want to try to set yourself up for success from the start of the season where you're relying on your soil health to provide fertility to your plants. That said, you can touch up on your nutrients during the season with granulated or liquid fertilizers if there's a reason for it. Many fertilizers will be too strong, so choose carefully. I recommend seaweed, fish emulsion, and compost teas because they have multiple benefits and they aren't too concentrated. So these are liquids that you can just spray onto your plant leaves. You can also choose uh, stronger granulated fertilizers like that bag of Harmony uh, by sprinkling it near your plants and scratching it in with a hoe or a rake. But be very careful not to let granulated fertilizer touch your plants because it could cause burns. And if you do choose to fertilize during this season, um, make sure that the NPK ratio lines up with your goals. Uh, you, if you don't want your plant to grow more leaves, like if you would prefer it to grow zucchini or peppers or potatoes, think about uh, whether or not you really want to use a high nitrogen fertilizer. And you always want to make sure that you have a good reason for adding fertilizer because it is easy to overdo it. Do not over amend. Uh, we talked about nitrogen, but there are a lot of different nutrients that you can overdo it on. An excess of nutrients can cause plant weakness and susceptibility to pests and diseases, just the same as a deficiency. It can also block other nutrients, as we talked about, and cause environmental issues. So some nutrients are called mobile, which means that they move through the soil easily and drain out quickly. Others are called immobile, and they tend to stay in the soil for a very long time, and both will cause problems if you add too much. If you add too much of an immobile nutrient, it can build up in your soil over time and become toxic. This is why you need to be careful with micronutrient amendments because many of them are toxic when you have too much. If you add too much of a mobile nutrient, it can run out of your soil and cause environmental pollution. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the biggest culprits in fertilizer pollution. Their runoff causes algal blooms, it contaminates groundwater, and can even pollute the air. 
This is another issue with synthetic fertilizers. Many of them are highly concentrated and water soluble, which means that they can easily cause pollution. So just follow your soil test guidelines, measure your amendments, and always err on the side of not enough. You can always add more, but you can't take it back out. Except for compost, you can always add more compost. Okay, so let's review. Soil is made up of air, water, organic matter, and minerals like sand, silt, and clay. The mix of particles determines your soil type, which doesn't change. Soil structure is based on the pores in your soil. Compaction of these pores will ruin your soil. You can learn your soil type at home and use the CEC from your soil test. Organic matter is essential to the nutrition and structure of your soil, and soil microorganisms do a lot of invisible work underground. Compost is the best way to increase your soil organic matter. Soil samples are an easy and accurate way to get recommendations on what amendments to add. Soil pH is usually the most important thing to adjust after organic matter and uh, making sure your soil structure is healthy. Plants need a wide variety of nutrients, most of which can be found in compost, but there are many other fertilizer sources out there. Nitrogen is important to your plants, but it's easy to overdo it and weaken them. Other nutrients can also be overadded, so make sure that you are following your soil test guidelines. For safety, you should always choose fertilizers that are approved for organic farming, and slow-release fertilizers tend to be a better choice than quick. You should focus on adding fertility at the beginning of the season so that you can minimize fertilizer use during the year. So I know that all of the nutrients and all of the amendments sound very scary and complicated. You probably will not have very many issues with your soil. Chances are, if you put plants in the ground, they will grow. You do not need to have the exact perfect percentage of each mineral in order to have a successful garden, but the information is here in case you ever need it. Just add organic matter, follow your soil test recommendations, and don't do anything crazy, and you will be just fine. So here are a few resources if you want more information, and I have a lot more, including books if you're interested in learning more about soil science. So first of all, university extensions are a great resource. The Virginia Tech Extension, our Smith County office, uh, they have the best local knowledge, and you should definitely reach out to them with questions. Uh, but if you're looking online, a lot of other university extensions also have really great guides that can be uh, helpful resources. Uh, the Virginia Tech Soil Lab website has really detailed information on soil sampling and test results, so I would definitely go there before you do your next soil sample. Uh, I also linked one PDF that has a bit more detailed explanation on the meaning of the soil test results. Uh, here's also the flowchart, so you can try the ribbon test. Um, and then if you are looking for more detailed information on soil science, like really detailed, uh, this textbook from CASFIS, the Center for Agroecology Agro and Sustainable Food Systems, uh, is a really solid resource. Uh, so thank you for listening, everybody, and uh, please ask questions because I'm sure that this didn't all make sense to everybody. Thanks.